can assemble all these beams so this is the uh, second version and third version so if we need more strong strength means we can give uh, columns in between and this is another version so all these are without roof and this is the fifth version and this is the foundation one part is either we can use concrete for the foundation but in colder climate if the concrete won't work means we can stabilize the soil by using some admixtures and we can make the foundation thank you presenting the uh, the concept of uh, microwave landing system for the helicopters just before with your permission sir two minutes i will uh, get into the organization i come from uh, my company is called uh, smart innovations and uh, it is basically in the product design and uh, uh, development and we have been doing this for i mean, I, I personally have been doing this for almost uh, can you have the next one uh, 25 years with uh, different customers all around the oh, sorry yeah. okay. <coughs> uh, we have been doing it uh, uh, for different uh, companies uh, in the engineering uh, all around the world uh, whether US, uh, Europe or uh, uh, even East Asian uh, countries uh, lot of work we did initially from how do you go about uh, meeting the quality requirements, meeting the timely requirements of this uh, country and then came up with the uh, idea of uh, doing the development work here and delivering it to the customer including the prototypes for this. Can you go to, uh, sorry. Uh, these are some of the works which we have done and uh, uh, something which is uh, mentionable here is uh, I come from the Indian Space Research Organization. I worked there for almost 20 years. And after that, I went into the uh, engineering and uh, design services uh, of uh, DSQ and then Plexion Technologies. And now uh, we have set up, all our uh, colleagues, we have set up the uh, organization called Smart Innovation, which is about six years, seven years old organization. And we have been helping uh, some of the uh, private companies like uh, uh, Team Indus to develop their spacecraft, which is uh, uh, landing on the moon, then the rover. and uh, some of the work which we did for the uh, uh, industries outside is uh, Bluetooth transmitter. This is basically for the future uh, uh, requirements of the automotives, where uh, the automotives will be self-controlled, uh, sometimes maybe by the voice. And because the Bluetooth can accept the voice from different uh, uh, level, different uh, distances, uh, it will not be controlled by the driver himself, one who is in control. So we had to restrict the uh, uh, response of the Bluetooth device uh, to something like two to three feet, so that no other person, if it talks and gives the command, the vehicles. So we did that type of work. We did uh, uh, work for the Renault uh, Nissan also, and uh, some amount of composite work for uh, the Navy uh, uh, torpedoes also. And these are the different companies which have worked. Now, since we are working in companies uh, all around the world. Uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Sudarshan said here, that a uh, lot of defense in different countries depends on their products, depend on the MSME. Small companies are doing a lot of work uh, on the development of smaller products, which then are converted into the uh, subsystems and then integrated into system design. Uh, one of our customers, in uh, this and the partner latter uh, has been working on the uh, development of microwave radars and we have been helping them on development of the uh, system called as Holisor which is a volumetric instantaneous safety in omnidirectional range. Uh, basically uh, this we uh, thought that it is the proper system for the helicopters to look into the near range uh, without, uh, even if it is not being seen uh, um, in a 
the visible range is not there, even if there is a, a fog, even if there is a smoke, and some, uh, if, even if it's a night, it may not be, uh, it may be possible with the helicopter to see this. These are the different uh, uh, scenarios in which the helicopters will need uh, uh, assistance, helicopter pilot will need assistance to land safely on the, uh, at the helipad. Uh, one is darkness in the night. If he has to operate, he has to have some clarity on where he is landing, what type of uh, obstacles are there, intrusions are there. Uh, even if when he's uh, landing in a slightly lesser uh, uh, light uh, condition and there are uh, big structures, he gets into the problem. And uh, he might have a problem if he's not seeing. And uh, sometimes he gets completely uh, blinded by the light, even the uh, very harsh light which is coming from some direction. And he may not see the wires uh, of the uh, transmission lines. Uh, sometimes when there are number of helicopters uh, flying in a particular area where there is a fog or storm or rain, then there is a problem of uh, helicopter. So these are different scenarios in which uh, the helicopters will like to, uh, helicopter pilot will like to get some early indication of what is there in front of him. So what this company was doing was, uh, it has been uh, working on a uh, radar, which is not at the high height. Normally the radars in the uh, uh, airports are at a height and they look at uh, the scenario down and scan the area so that any intrusion when the uh, aircraft is uh, uh, being taxied or being uh, uh, taken out, the intrusions of uh, ground support equipment can cause a problem to the aircraft. So to avoid such, uh, and, and uh, these radars uh, particularly have a lot of uh, interference coming from the spurious things like uh, the metallic particle or metallic objects uh, embedded in the ground because it is seen from a top it becomes a difficult thing to separate those things. And uh, this is to be uh, controlled by the uh, ATC. What this company came out with the idea is have a uh, microwave uh, radar, uh, a sort of a sensor, which is a transmitter, microwave transmitter, and trans receiver, and keep it just parallel to the uh, ground so that in that range, if somebody uh, comes, it will be uh, immediately uh, located by that uh, radar. And for this invention, which they completed, they got the uh, patent from United States as well as uh, uh, Europe. What the problem was that within a short zone, they have to find out the right frequency, which will not interfere with the different radars which are coming and at the same time will give them the sufficient uh, range in which it can uh, get the uh, sense of the thing. Also, the attenuation should be low. So they came up with that, within that range, somewhere around the K band, they came out with the frequency in which this particular microwave band works, this particular uh, sensor works. Uh, how we help them is basically developing the complete housing for the whole uh, system and then uh, customizing this for different uh, requirements and we have been doing it for some time for them <coughs> another thing was this radar should not uh, have much power in that because uh, in this region the human beings are also being uh, also moving and if there is a lot of power that can cause a problem so this particular radar works on a very low power that is 0 0.001 uh, watts per centimeter square while as the uh, allowed is much higher than that. Uh, that lower one is the one which the sensor works. Now, uh, having developed that radar, uh, the way it was being uh, uh, marketed or the way it was being uh, utilized in the different scenarios, one of them is the bus or the uh, vehicle which has to move in the night, which has to move, even if there is a fog, even if there is a storm, some of the vehicles have to move on the road. And then if there is a bend in the road, they are not able to see properly. So in those situations, uh, this radar was used as a uh, you can it electronic eye, an electronic light for them, headlight for them, and was kept in place. So the two of them will be able to uh, see the, if there is a uh, pro uh, intrusion on the road, 
and if uh, there is an intrusion, they can slow down. The range of the radar was about 300 meters, and uh, the conical angle in which it is seeing is about 10 degrees. So two of them together will give them the complete picture. And if you see in the smaller picture there, unfortunately, we don't have a bigger picture. There is a display in front of the uh, driver, just next to the steering wheel, where he sees where are the intrusions coming from, how far is the intrusion, and accordingly, he can slow down and uh, come to that uh, level. Now, uh, same thing, he can see without, even if there is no light, even in this type of fog, he is able to see that. And this has been used in the uh, European region by different uh, uh, automotive uh, companies, or particularly the service companies using automotives. And now, automotive companies have started implementing it in their uh, thing as an additional uh, uh, sub, uh, thing, axial, uh, or, uh, ancillary. So uh, <coughs> this, in the uh, next one, was taken forward. And I think uh, airport of Milan uses this for finding out the intrusions coming on the airport in the uh, path of the uh, taxiing path of the aircraft. And then this is integrated with the ATC system, where they will be seeing on the screen the complete uh, aircraft, complete uh, picture of the aircraft, and what are the intrusions coming, so that they can guide the uh, aircraft in a proper way to the uh, uh, right parking place. Now, what we thought or we discussed with our partners or the clients, can we develop this for the helicopter landing system? And the idea came out there are two ways of doing it. One is for the uh, from the ground, you can uh, control this, where the radar can be placed at the ground with the 30 degrees of the cone angle. We can arrange number of these, not single, but maybe an array of these uh, radars together. Then look at the helicopter from the other side and then give the uh, pilot instructions from the ground. So this is a sort of a ground control uh, 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 instrument which will be giving the uh, instructions to the uh, pilot. In different scenarios, when even if there is a uh, fog or there is clouds, the uh, ground control will be seeing how many helicopters are, how far they are, and they will be able to control. Even if there is a smoke, he will be able to uh, guide the uh, helicopter from there. And the uh, last one is the platform. This particular radar is so small. It's about, uh, with this particular thing, we are expecting it to be about 30 kgs. And it can be put on a uh, mobile platform. In one scenario, we have put it on a, uh, we are thinking of putting it on a truck, small truck, so that it can be taken into the field where there is an urgent need of uh, helicopter being operating for some requirements, some emergency requirements, something like that, and on the uh, ship also, where the helicopters are going to land. The second scenario is, uh, the, for that, the radar can be uh, used, the different three of them in one row, and three, uh, so nine uh, radars can be used, and you can increase the angle in which. Here we are using the 600 uh, meter range. So because we are using the 600 meter range, the angle of the uh, conical angle reduces to five degrees, because the same power has been put into the same. That is connected to the, uh, by software, to the uh, uh, visual uh, system, which uh, is seen by the, uh, uh, ground control uh, command and on the radio link, they can give the command to the helicopter pilot. Now this is the another scenario where a smaller system, which is lighter, can be adopted on the helicopter itself. You can have this angle of 90 degrees and reduce the range from 600 meters to 300 meters. Because it is already on the helicopter, he will be getting it quickly. So the range can be reduced to 300 meters and the angle can be increased to 10 degrees. And that way, we can have the full scenario in front of the uh, helicopter when it is moving forward, or put it down and get this. So at the bottom, we can have two rays of uh, th four of this and four in the other direction. The best way is like a um, eye of a bee, where there are a number of pixels. So similarly, you can have a number of uh, radar uh, uh, sensors here, and from that, you can get the uh, scenario what happens below the uh, 
helicopter. This is one uh, area which we are thinking of. We have not developed it completely for the uh, helicopter as of now, but we are working on different scenarios. And the other one is, it will have a uh, 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 display similar to what we are talking about in the automotive, but I think for the helicopter, uh, I think we will have to look into much more uh, complex display for this purpose. And then, fully, as I said, for the insect type of thing, the full yes, full thing uh, going uh, looking down downwards, and this will have more uh, uh, radars obviously. And uh, okay, the distinctive features are it's always safe. There is no uh, harm to anybody, uh, any human beings. It's green, uses the radio waves which are very weak. Uh, it's reliable because there are no mechanical parts involved in this. It's compact, it's a small uh, size, maybe about 50 centimeters in the diameter, that much will be. It's accurate because every time it's continuously uh, locating. Then, uh, of course, it gives the early warning. Uh, these are advantages, the similar things what I have talked about. and. Uh, Finally, what is the other developments which are required for this purpose? Uh, for the adaptation for the helicopter, we will have to do the design and uh, preparation of the uh, housing system properly so that it is accommodated in the uh, helicopter in the right place and then integrated with the helicopter without affecting the aerodynamic characteristics of the uh, helicopter. And then some amount of electrical work which we'll have to do to get those 80 watts at 20, 20, uh, 228 uh, uh, holds and uh, other thing is uh, how do you define that pilot system uh, where the uh, visual interface is uh, required? We'll have to do that work. And uh, of course, finally, is the test. Okay, I think these are the certificates of uh, um, patent. I'll skip that. Thank you. Okay. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, so we hear about avalanche and other, uh, you know, extreme environment um, uh, incidents or accidents all the time, right? And, and and we typically ask in India, you know, if we can send spacecraft to Mars, when why can't we protect our soldiers in living in extreme environment? So, uh, of course, this uh, on the left hand side is a February 2016 avalanche uh, in the Sonam camp, uh, where we lost uh, you know a lot of our men, and probably you know it became a, a media spectacle with Hanuman Tapa who died after being retrieved after so many days. And, and this is very recent, uh, three or four days ago in the Guret sector uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, where we also lost you know, four or five of our men. And uh, the same Guret sector, we had another avalanche a year back in January 2017, where we lost uh, 20 of our soldiers and four civilians. Uh, so, so these are some of the things that uh, you know, quite bothered me and, and my colleagues. And uh, so this was before uh, you know, the armed forces or Indian Army came up with the compendium. So, uh, I wrote an email to General Saha, who is not here right now, um, and then I visited. Uh, so it's been kind of close to two years uh, that we can potentially provide some solutions to take care of some of the uh, to, keep, to take care of the problems. Uh, so that's why I'm going to talk about what we call the integrated uh, habitation for super high altitude areas. Um, Okay, so what are the challenges in extreme environments, right? Um, so uh, I, I work in space exploration. You know, we work very closely with ISRO, and I also work with NASA in the U.S., uh, where I'm serving as a professor. Uh, so it's, you know, what we believe, uh, the environment, uh, you know, challenging an extreme environment is only second to in space, uh, particularly Siachen and Salter Ridge areas and Dra sector. Uh, so we know the strategic positions meant up to uh, at 22,000 feet, uh, snow snowstorms can last weeks. Uh, temperature can plummet to minus 55 degrees centigrade. A wind blasting and avalanche, um, and then shifting and uneven surfaces. So we can have a camp on a on the glacier surface, but it does not mean we have to, uh, we can stay there all the time. We have to actually shift our camp. So if we have a, a habitat, you know that needs to, needs to be moved all the time. Uh, it's, it's very cumbersome if you have rigid or you know and something which takes several weeks to even uh, deploy. And then, of course, the danger, ever-increasing danger of crevasses, where uh, we lose our uh, men all the time. 
Uh, we have around 6,000 troops or more than that, uh, something, you know, it's not out in the open. Uh, on the glacier as well as in the ridge, uh, more in other high altitude areas like Dras, as well as in the northern sector. And, uh, you know, the other challenging of uh, issue is the logistical, um, uh, you know, the limited logistical support, right? We, we can carry only with our advanced light helicopter as well as uh, the Mi-17. Uh, so we just cannot carry rigid, you know, concrete or even concrete may not work because it won't settle down in a uh, colder climate. So current habitats uh, have uh, tremendous problems uh, we know of, and I'll, I'll go, uh, probably pictures will be better. And before that, you know, what, what is the cost uh, you know, of operating in extreme environment, right? When it comes to national security, we cannot equate it to cost. Uh, so there's no real cost, uh, but we also know that we are spending quite a bit, and the number is not, you know, how you define it, right? Uh, because we have to de deliver kerosene, so there's a cost involved in del delivering kerosene by, you know, helicopter and so forth. So it's a fairly complex thing. Um, so we are talking about 6 to 20 crore to man our high altitude area just in Siachen, Salter Ridge for a single day. So it's a huge amount of uh, money and resources, so something we can probably minimize. And on top of that, loss of lives, right? We, are, we have lost around 900 soldiers, out of which you know more than 33 are officers. The uh, number is slightly old, probably a year old, which was uh, put in the parliament. And then we also see several deaths every year because of climatic conditions. And since the 20, 2003 ceasefire, uh, it's, uh, the most deaths have been due to uh, the weather-related or climate-related issues. Uh, and the conditions we are still learning. Uh, we don't know, of course, uh, of the required secrecy. Uh, so we, I'm working with the uh, ADB and Army headquarters to, to know more of the environment, possibly a trip uh, planned for the uh, next couple of months. So these are the state-of-the-art habitats and camps. On the left-hand side, uh, so this is the, the pref prefab uh, you know, uh, fiberglass uh, house. So these are um, the Stromer tent, which is you know pretty common, and so these are the igloo, right? So it's based out of this. So you have you can see the airlock, and these are based uh, made out of panels. And I've been told that these panels, of course, you know, because helicopter can carry very minimal load, and they start early in the morning, just before uh, dawn, and then ends uh, mid morning. Uh, so you have to carry this panel over several weeks, and then you have to integrate them with uh, you know some specialized uh, trained soldiers. It can take up to several weeks or months to install one of the huts. Uh, so, so you can imagine if, if the surface shifts under you, then you have to relocate the tent. Uh, so it's a huge logistical challenge. Uh, I think it should be minimized. And then, of course, this, uh, this habitat has other issues because it's, it's not fire retardant, so it's uh, very highly inflammable. And I've been told it's not out in the open, probably you would not read on newspaper. Uh, so we have lost soldiers because of fire in this habitat. Uh, so I think we can definitely uh, completely eliminate that uh, problem. Go to the next slide. So this is another uh, a few pictures just to represent the challenges. Uh, so this is another alpine tents. So you can see the challenges, right? One is anchoring. It's loose snow, so you cannot really anchor it. And there's, you know, blast, uh, wind blast all the time. And then, you know, this is, f by the way, it's a kitchen, uh, the food, food you know, preparation is going on, and this is possibly on the ridge. Uh, Saltura Ridge can be as only w as wide as only four or five meters, so you can see our soldiers manning 24 slash seven at that altitude. And so, if you fall on either side, like you are dead. There have been cases where avalanche or wind, uh, you know, hurricane, not hurricane, but uh, uh, the winds in those high altitude have actually blown our soldiers and our camp altogether. So this is the Sonam camp, uh, named after Sonam Wangchuk. Uh, this is where our February 2016 avalanche happened. Uh, so these are various camps and storage areas. This is, by the way, it's our medical facility out there. So it's just a simple tent. Uh, no temperature control. We know our soldiers have been operated upon inside one of uh, you know camps uh, where there is no thermal control. So a lot of soldiers went in just to provide body heat so the temperature can be increased. Uh, so it's, and then this is, uh, it's on the ridge. This is also on the ridge, uh, so you can see this makeshift. And so there will be heli helipad somewhere here. Uh, this is Sonam Camp, this Sonam Camp, probably old picture, and so forth, right? So these are the kind of challenges uh, our soldiers face. Uh, so, you know, kudos to them uh, for serving in those extreme environments. So, what we are providing uh, is a single technology 
that is, uh, you know, or I call it single technology, multiple solutions. Uh, I, I need to stress on the fact that we cannot have a single habitat that applies everywhere, that is applicable to everywhere, all the locations, uh, because we also have high altitude areas in Arunachal Pradesh. It's completely different because the tree line is at a higher altitude, and plus it's very wet and warm, and it rains almost every other day. Uh, so, but we, we, we can provide uh, something, and it's a very high TRL. Uh, so this is how it looks like. Uh, so you can have a airlock, uh, the central habitat, as well as a hygiene system. And, and you know, right now, as you know, the DRDO uh, experiment with the, uh, you know, the bio uh, bathroom, it kind of failed, or it was not highly successful. And plus, uh, you know, it's not temperature control. So our, our soldiers actually go uh, to to restroom in minus 55 degrees centigrade, and at that. Uh, you know, altitudes and pressure levels, uh, you know, our bodily functions don't work the way it should. Uh, so we cannot go to the potty, you know, in, in five minutes and come back. It probably can take 30 minutes to an hour, right? So we are proposing that the habitation, I mean, hygiene system should be, you know, attached like we, we see it here. So uh, it's a habitation with uh, hybrid, uh, you know, energy generation. Uh, control pressurization, so I can control the pressure. I don't want a one bar, like one atmosphere, uh, because then there's a problem issue with deacclimatization. Because I'm operating outside, then I come back at high pressure, so it's something not desired. Uh, wind blast and avalanche protection, and I'll come to avalanche protection. It's no, it's not at all trivial. I'm not trying to say that we can something we can solve right away. Uh, otherwise, we could have done this long time back. Uh, ballistic protection, small arms and mortar, so small arms including AK-47, mortar 81 mm. Uh, cooking, hygiene, waste disposal uh, is, is a big issue because of environmental things. Uh, we used to do all our uh, you know, ablutions outside before and throw it to the crevasses, not anymore. Thermal insulation, uh, insulation fire retardant, medical quarantine, and possibly radiation, biological, and uh, chemical warfare protection as well. So as you can see, it's a very advanced uh, kind of habitat. Uh, so uh, so we are. Uh, it's not a concept. We actually have built prototypes uh, for other applications, including for space station. Uh, so it's very scalable and comes with a variety of shapes and sizes, right? So it's scalable, so I can make a one meter, extend the same analysis to 30 meter, and it'll still work. Uh, so it's a very patented, uh, so I'm not, that's why I'm not going into the details. So it's called ultra high performance vessel, the highest specific strength to weight ratio containment architecture of any sort available on this uh, planet. Uh, so exceptional specific energy and uncoupled pressure restrained loads. Uh, so actually, I can create a hole and create a window, but uh, you know, the pressure. Uh, you know, it can still maintain the integrity, right? So there's absolutely no issue with that. Uh, so it is at a high TRL uh, because it's based on space technology. Uh, we have built things which have flown in space, uh, Genesis 1 and 2. And this is the uh, world's most advanced soft goods, uh, you know, habitation to ever been proposed. Uh, we are working with ISRO on several projects. Uh, they're at the conceptual phase. Uh, so we're working on the booster recovery uh, for GSLV uh, line. Uh, particularly for Mark II right now. And uh, we are also uh, working with uh, VSSC on uh, inflatable space station, which is under uh, study right now, uh, because we cannot launch a rigid uh, space station. And then also on high altitude platform, which I'll be talking. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm almost uh, coming to the end of this part of the discussion, and I'll talk about the second. Uh, so as you can see, this is very modular and interchangeable. So I can make this one for uh, you know our special forces, which can carry you know on the back, can rapidly deploy it, and deployment compared to weeks or months, you know it takes probably an hour or so. That's the kind of thing we are talking about, and of course it might require more time to anchor it and all. And anchoring in snow is no uh, easy feat. And then you know I can come up with you know variety of uh, you know modular designs depending on what our needs are. So have we? built it, as I said, we have, and uh, so this is, you can see the human scale from here, here, and this is how the packaging looks like, right, so it's very flexible, you can put it, and of course, you know, it, it has, uh, based on the application, whether you need ballistic protection or not, not everywhere on, uh, on the Siachen Glacier, we need ballistic protection, not, you know, Pakistani fire may not reach to certain, uh, after certain distance, so we, we cannot make one single solution. So avalanche, and you know, I said we can provide solution. It's no, as I said, you know, forces to be reckoned reckon with. Uh, extremely uh, dangerous, uh, but they also work. Uh, if, if, if we understand avalanche, you know, the various types of avalanche. We keep on avala saying avalanche, but then you know, can be ice wall collapse and um, you know, cornic surac collapse and stuff like that, which happened in Sonam Post. Uh, 
early last year. So this is the kind of protection you give to a just single pylon, electric pylon. So this is the kind of, it's a completely you know, made of steel. Uh, so we are kind of fighting against those kinds of forces, right? So how do you do it? That's something, you know, uh, our habitat can be actually buried under the snow uh, with just a, uh, you know, exit and the avalanche can actually go over it. So we're working on various design. This is just a kind of a flyover of the exterior. So this is how it might look like. So on the front you can see is an airlock. Uh, so you can zip it and unzip it uh, so that we can maintain the pressure inside. Okay, so with that, uh, it's not only, we were not only working on one thing, um, so, uh, you know, our, uh, uh, the, the machinery uh, which are custom made, uh, we can also do a lot of other things, but uh, one at a time. Um, so this avalanche protection, uh, protective gear uh, that can actually float a person, you know, with uh, radio beacons, uh, so it's something, uh, and then of course, you know, small portable uh, habitats for special forces, uh, helicopter landing attenuation airbags. Uh, these are very high performance, as you can see. And for the booster recovery for ISRO, we are working. Um, uh, we are landing a 50 ton vehicle from 80 kilometer, traveling at two kilometers per second to soft landing on water. So that's the kind of performance uh, material we're talking about. Uh, and then, of course, you know, uh, habitat to be deployed on uh, snowmobiles. And this is railgun, as, as you have heard, probably Diardo is working on it. So this structure can actually contain the energy of a railgun as well. You know, if you're putting railgun on a frigate or destroyer or, or a submarine in, in that case, right? I mean, if it doesn't work, you have to contain that energy somehow. So this is, uh, we also had a project with USDOD where we worked on a, such a containment. Hyperbaric chamber for medical, uh, you know, for medical use in high altitude. Uh, this is a propellant, you can store actually cryogenic propellant in this and can uh, take tremendous amount of pressure. We have tested it to 150 PSI, no problem. And then also for submarine rescue. So I, I think our Navy uh, friends are, are not here, probably they would be interest, interested. So we also work on those things. All right, so next, uh, so that's my uh, habitation. Probably if you have questions, you can ask at the end. Uh, so this I'll quickly uh, talk about our long endurance stratospheric drone uh, for persistent flight coverage. So I'll hurry up. Um, so, so our flight system consists of the a balloon, an inflatable segment, and a payload segment. Uh, so an inflatable composed of what we call the perfect pumpkins. And you can stack a number of them and increase in size to get a desired payload. And then if you see, this is you know, where the different uh, platforms can operate. Um, satellites that uh, takes you know, million, hundreds of millions of dollars to operate. And you have high altitude uh, planes and our works here. And then at this altitude, you know, you can get up a hundred ki thousand kilometer range for communication, around 50 kilometer range for remote sensing or any military intelligence or SIGINT, right? Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, the normal drones and the smaller drones and the air aerostat, you know, which are tethered. Uh, so you can see the advantage. We are above the cloud system. We are above the jet stream. Uh, so, uh, you know, disturbances are, are less. And then uh, we operate at between 50 to 70,000 feet. We can control the altitude, and this is again a patentable control technology. So we can control, and using stratospheric wind direction, we can control uh, where we are for persistent coverage. Long duration, up to three months, uh, which is kind of unprecedented uh, for a low cost system. Uh, up to 150 kg payload, and we are working with ISRO SAC on the development of s sensors. And so these are diverse applications you can see. You can you know, use for urban planning, uh, you can use it for even for intelligence, uh, you know, urban intelligence and stuff like that. Uh, hurricane research or weather research, uh, military intelligence, you know, flood monitoring, disaster management, or a uh, communication uh, tower. Uh, so these are some of the kind of features. I don't have to uh, go in, in detail. Uh, we are planning to use space-based sensors, so um, uh, we are uh, trying to achieve resolution of like sub-10 centimeter resolution. Uh, using space space. So that's again unprecedented for military intelligence and other things. It's all weather, uh, all time, all day, all weather uh, system. Uh, easy to control, uh, eco-friendly, runs on solar power plus batteries. And then uh, of course uh, you can rapidly deploy it. Uh, and you don't need an extensive ground segment which you might need for a you know, high, uh, high uh, capacity drone like Predators and all. 
Okay, so I won't get into the details, just some of the metrics, uh, cost, operations cost is the total, like the first capital cost, flight time, persistent coverage, ground coverage, reusability, stealth capability, surface resolution, and then rapid deployment. Uh, and then, uh, so we, we, we do pretty well. Um, of course, you know, I, uh, there are only three color codes. So as you see, we can do, uh, we, we perform pretty well for all these metrics. So technology readiness level and outlook, where we are. Uh, current TRL is six, uh, so we are using NASA TRL definition. Uh, prototype tested in low altitude. I have a quick video I'll, uh, I'm, I'm about to complete. Uh, full scale prototype development in another six to 12 months. So we are seeking funds under TDF and also we've uh, full scale testing within the next uh, one and a half year, two years. Uh, so we need not, uh, we are not necessarily waiting for TDF, so we are also putting our own money and research funds. Uh, planning and setup, uh, so we also have the inflatable flight system, uh, R&D and uh, possibly uh, we are floating a startup. Uh, ISRO sensor development, so SAC, we are partnering with ISRO for the sensor development. And then industry, so uh, I won't take the name, but we are currently in discussion uh, for an industry partner in India. So this is uh, the video of a flight demonstration at lower altitude. Uh, so we can actually, so this is being actively controlled. So I can control the altitude uh, very easily, no problem. Very rapid ascent and descent. Uh, something you, you don't see from an airship or an aerostat. You know, for aerostat you tether it and then you bring it down very slowly. Uh, so this is something we can, and it's been done in May 2017 uh, in, you know, outside and two years back we did it like in, in, in a controlled environment. Can go to the next slide. Okay, so, uh, so that's my conclusion, actually. Uh, so if you go vis visit Siachen or the base camp, you, you hear or you see these lines. Uh, nothing endures at minus 55 degrees except the commitment to your nation and your man. So the land is so barren and the passes is, uh, and the pass is so high that only the fiercest of enemies and the best of friends wants to visit us. So I'm going to change that. The land is so barren and passes so high that only the fiercest of enemies and the best of friends and the passionate engineers would want to visit us. Uh, so that's that's us. So we're trying to do it. Thank you very much. Very interesting concepts. Not just this concept. As I see, it's uh, getting into reality. Uh, could I request uh, Captain Pranesha? Friends, today I will be just presenting IFF for AFV, a concept which is uh, quite uh, old in the sense that it has been just uh, coming up and down for, for a long, uh, long period of time. Here is a, a juncture where the technology has just come to a level where quite a few problems which are faced in this particular area could be just handled. That is the point which I'm just making. Uh, basically, I would like, to, I have just uh, split my talk in the following uh, heading. About company, I briefly just talk about. After that, I go for basic concepts of IFF, followed with IFF buildup, which exists at uh, Alpha Design Technology, then a proposal which we have, which I'm just making, then I consult it. Alpha Design Technologies is a 13 years old company who are just working only in the defense field. We are just supplying items to the defense services. We are just quite uh, quite a few uh, area where we are just covering. Uh, basically, this is the spectrum of area where we are just uh, working. Multidisciplinary, multi-product type of company. We are just struggling to just see that, yes, uh, we just contribute to the Indian defense in the right earnestness. <laughs> Suffice to say that ADTL is a healthy MSME with good and consistent turnover and comfortable order book position as we stand right now. So I'm not just talking on, that, on this issue. Uh, if anybody wants to just know more about the company, I think I can just discuss that separately. Coming to IFF, identification of friend or foe, the technology which is involved in that is it comes under a level where you just challenge your enemy and enemy has to just respond in a particular uh, way. And if the response is right, you consider him as friend, otherwise you treat him as enemy. Essentially, it will consist of uh, 
basically an interrogator and set of transponders. Interrogator will just have an uplink and a downlink. In uplink, it just questions and the transponder gives a response and that response will be received and will be interpreted. So this system is just quite old. It has been just in existence ever since Second World War. The basic structure of an interrogator I have just given here, it consists of a transmitter and a receiver and a controller. You transmit a known question, get a known response, interpret that, and then move ahead. Similarly, the transponder is another structure which is a transmitter and receiver. And what I have shown in the white is the transmitter portion. What I have just shown in the red is the receive portion. So it's a set of two sets of transmitter receivers which will be just performing the challenge and response interpretation related issue. Although this has been in existence for quite long, in the recent past, a lot of evolution has just taken place in this area. And this, is, this particular system is used both in the civil aviation as a mandatory thing for the control of the air, air strips and air uh, stations and also in the military. The specific norms and the specific deployment patterns could be just different, but the equipment is the same. Now, this is the context where I am just talking. The evolution path of this IFF I have just put over here. What you see on the left side is how it has evolved in the military and on the right side, how it was adopted in the civilian world. If I just see in the military, it started with Second World War. It has just uh, was existing as a secondary radar for quite long. After that, there came, a, uh, came this monopulse technology, which has just given a boost up in its performance, which has resulted in Mark 12 SSR, which eventually suffered certain, this thing, that is when you are radiating in the war field, you, your identity is just known. So to circumvent that, the security system on that was the buildup. If you see, what was just there earlier was mode four security, and now it has moved to mode five. Mode five is a spread spectrum, code, uh, code division spread, uh, spread spectrum based uh, modulation, which just brings in non-interceptability of the signals which are just radiated. So combination of mode 12A with mode 5 is a very potent sort of technology. And also, in the civilian world, it was just taken as at crabs initially and has just evolved into mode S SSR on which several other subsystems to improve the safety of the aircraft has just come into existence, which I have just listed over there. There. One basic thing which you just see here is over the period of time, there is a lot of standardization which has just happened. The way in which you just question, the way in which the response comes up, the, the occasion where you will just use that, they, these have been just standardized. Two standardizing bodies, one is the uh, uh, basically ECOW in USA, which is for the civilian segment they are standardizing, and then STANAG is just standardizing with respect to the military use. With this standardization, most of the formats are just uh, uh, clear. Then large ingress of programmable digital technology is another thing which has happened in the recent past. If I just compare a huge uh, interrogator which was just there uh, about uh, 15, 20 years back, the entire thing is a small, uh, a small package right now doing the same performance with the same degree of uh, capability. And then networkable device, these devices has been made as networkable. So that whatever you have here, you can share it with others, which is an important factor with respect to the net centric warfare. Then electronic beam steering is a technology which has just evolved and it is quite uh, affordable in this particular area. Then specific functionality through change in waveform. And non-interceptability of IFF signal, that is mode five, technology which has just come in, and the reduction in size, weight, and uh, other parameters drastically. Now, this is the context where I'm just looking at adopting an IFF to a AFV. If you see, IFF for mobile ground units, in the, in the case of 
both static uh, airfields as well as with respect to the ships, it has been adopted uh, quite, quite well. But when it comes to AFV, there have been additional constraints in terms of cost, size, then weight, the phenomenon of ground clutter. That is, since it is at a low altitude, the ground clutter will just uh, uh, swamp the total system. So these are the constraints under which th it has to operate on a AFV. So past experiments which, are, which has been done in this particular area had been to just go for an infrared laser, that is to remove the RF, use an infrared so that you, you won't just uh, get that clutter related issue. But the range will be just off obviously less. Uh, if you can get about five to six kilometers, you should be just pretty happy about that. But what Army needs currently is around a range of about 10 to 20 kilometers range is what is just required. Then RF millimeter wave is the other te technology which has been just done, which has its own plus and minus points. And the third is the RF L band. That is whatever AFF technology which is available, adopt that into this system. Basically, when I just look into the, the, the requirement of the IFF system in a uh, uh, combat vehicle would be mostly not from the point of view of uh, containment of fratricide or uh, uh, the, the attack on neutral, uh, stopping attack on the neutral forces in the surrounding. It is more from the point of view of attaching identity to, uh, to the items which has been detected in the war field. If you see, the way the service just operates is that it collects all the data, it has to identify, then apply an engagement rule on that to just see how I can just uh, uh, engage the target. In the current scenario, these are just quite consistent and the, it, which will result in not more, many uh, cases where you will be just firing on your own force. But when you get in for net centric warfare with these sort of uh, this thing, it adds additional dimension where you need to just take care of this one. Basically, the identification is graded in several uh, this thing. That is, you just uh, collect all information, add that together, and then appreciate what is the situation. Then, at some level, you have to just see, get in into a question and answer sort of this thing to just ascertain that the, uh, the, the target which is encountered is really enemy and then engage. Now, this is a area which is drastically changing in the context of net-centric warfare. So, and also an another issue, two, two more slides, another issue which is just uh, there is that the combined uh, net-centric warfare is bringing in joint operation with uh, different this thing. The identification which I have need to be shared with some other sister force. So that also will be another challenge which could be just taken care. Uh, this is a scenario, deployment scenario, where you have uh, different application for the IFF. In Alpha, we have just uh, worked for last about four or five years to just develop the mode S uh, type, that is totally digitized interrogator transponder and CIT, which we have just supplied to DRDO, and it has been deployed on the uh, AVAX aircraft currently. This is fully qualified MODES system. Basically, what I'm just, uh, other activities which you are doing is, we have a team of about 25 people who are just working in this particular area only. So the related other area also we are just working at. The proposal which I'm just making currently is the technical feasibility of RF, uh, the L-band RF, as an assured with, together with the assured non-interceptability could be a solution which can just get in because the clutter and other issues could be just taken care of by signal processing, which uh, demo, the, 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 the demonstration level products are just available on that. Then other thing would be, yes, we can just change the infrared, uh, this thing, and use the standardized gnomes over here. That is the other rather thing. Joint development of ADB. Uh, with total compliance. And then army platform 
the, we can provide this to the army platform to just evolve the operational norms which are just needed together with this. Because without operational norms, this system has, has no meaning. So it gives a wherewithal to just move ahead in that direction. Here I listed the advantages, advantages and disadvantages. I will not get into that. If I look into the future, basically what happens would be that at the bottom layer, you have only interrogator and uh, transponder, which is an equipment. But net-centric warfare works with the information which is derived out of this. This should be shareable. Basic way in which it is just moving ahead is this needs to be just networked and will just give you the wherewithal to just appreciate the situation and then engage the target uh, more effectively. And we need to be partners in this particular journey. That's what I, I would like to just conclude with this. Thank you. Wing Commander Sushil Kumar. Uh, we are running hugely behind schedule. We are exactly little more than an hour behind. So my, my request, uh, uh, try and be sticking to your time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on 2nd January 2016, we had attacked on uh, Patan Court Air Force Base and it created a lot of uh, media coverage. Uh, ironically, uh, around, a mu around two months before the incident, uh, I had given the same presentation to one of the chief of one of the civilian uh, security agencies, telling that our airfields are not that safe. And uh, it's just coincidence that it happened. After that, we had the URI attack. Probably these two incidents could have been averted if we had had a permanent aerial platform, which could have given a 24 uh, by 7 coverage. The present system of uh, protecting our air or uh, military bases is basically by uh, using watchtowers, foot patrols, and UAVs. The coverage area of a watchtower is generally restricted by the height. And we often hear news about our personnel getting exposed to enemy small arms fire and sniper fires. To overcome this problem, we in Amrita propose a uh, surveillance system using uh, hybrid aerostats. Our team consists of a startup company, basically our alumni from Amrita and IIT Kanpur. They are in charge for the design. Uh, we have Sharp Tools as our production partner. They'll be in charge for the pro product engineering and production. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Pandian, CEO of Sharp Tools. Uh, the company is a household name in India. Every, one in every second house has a sharp product in, uh, installed in their houses. So we have enough uh, experience in manufacturing. So this is a major development. Uh, previously, when we gave the presentation, we didn't have the production partner. So we realized that it should be at the initial stages itself. Because as mentored by uh, Dr. J. Chandrasekhar, who was uh, the dean of IIT Bombay before joining Abrita. I'll be covering uh, the topic under following heads. The comparison between aerostat and hybrid aerostats, Amrita technology demonstrators, advantages of UAV over a conventional aerostat, uh, applications, our proposal, what is the present status, and finally, the fin financial effect. Uh, aerostats are basically balloons, large balloons. They do provide large coverage area. But they do have problems. They are highly unstable. A major problem is fitment of these vertical and uh, horizontal fins. So the structure is quite weak. And they have a problem called blow-by. Blow-by is nothing but as the wind speed increases, the altitude of the 
aerostat comes down. So the coverage area reduces. What we propose is an hybrid aerostat in which as the wind velocity increases, we don't lose altitude, thereby there is no change in the coverage area. We have patented this particular design. Uh, it's a combination of an aerostat and kite. The volume is much smaller, around one-tenth the volume of a conventional aerostat. It maintains altitude irrespective of the wind velocity, M inherently stable, a longer endurance compared to any UAV. You can have a 24 by 7 coverage. The payload or car carrying capability also is much higher than a conventional aerostat. We did this technology demonstrator way back in 2014 as a BTEC project and we are happy that it has evolved into a product which can be used by the services. So this was the prototype and uh, the hangers what was taken in way back in 2014. Subsequently we have been giving presentations on this topic. The advantages are it's going to give continuous surveillance, very low initial and operating costs, it is stealthy in terms of optics, thermal, radar or thermal uh, signatures, hardly any maintenance except for periodically filling up the lifting gas. One problem uh, Army faces is the in using UAV is they require pilots, trained pilots. This can be operated by any Javan. In case of any attack, it assures a soft landing wherein we don't lose information. It takes around six hours to come down. Even if it is hit by a bullet and it gets punctured, it takes around six hours to come down. So we don't lose information immediately. Applications, basically perimeter surveillance at vital military bases, border surveillance, coastal, as coast guard and other marshy areas where they can use it. Balloon barrage is still a viable option because in future the air rates are going to be at very low level. It can duplicate the role of a balloon barrage as well. Uh, strategic assets like nuclear power plants and all can be protected. Our proposal is a constant altitude hybrid aerostat operating anywhere between 300 to 1000 feet. Up to 500 feet, it doesn't, it doesn't require any government permission, so we can safely operate. We also give an automatic uh, intrusion detection system up to 5 square kilometer, a manual detection up to 2 kilometer radius during night. Daytime video, we get around 7 square kilometer. Apart from that, if you are going to use the zoom facility, we can really look deep into the enemy territory. The present status is uh, the CRPF has shown interest in that. With the, within the financial powers of the local commander, he has gone for a scaled down version and which has been fabricated and uh, is under demonstration in the guest house. We have filed the patent. The production engineering by Sharp Tools is in progress. If the project is sanctioned, we are confident that we can execute it in 12 months. These are few of the uh, snaps from the uh, aerostat. We tried it under various weather conditions in North India, Sirsa and uh, Delhi. Uh, this one is in the CRPF camp in Coimbatore. We also went for the night vision uh, camera and uh, you could see uh, some human beings moving near a vehicle. So this is the present status and we are awaiting final approval from the Army Design Group. Total cost is around 75 lakhs and unit cost is extremely low compared to any UAV, about 8.5 to 25 lakhs. Did I finish? Is there any questions? I think. I, re I request all the speakers to come to the dais. May we have the questions from the audience?
mic. And the speaker. Uh, it was mentioned in one of the slides, uh, three th 300 kilojoules per kilogram is a number. And that, is, that was tested for a project, but if there's a specific requirement, that can be increased. Right, it's a variety of materials we use for specific applications like Dyneema, Vector, and Kevlar uh, in, in layers. And then we also use uh, tendons that takes that bears the load rather than the, uh, the envelope. That, that is not so high because in that range, so many polymers can give that 300. Uh, right, so that was uh, for a very specific uh, NASA application. Yeah. Anything more? Yeah, there being no questions, uh, let me sum it up. Uh, it's it's uh, it's been constantly a belief, and uh, Jan Sah has been extremely, I would say, bullish on this aspect. After those first few interactions, uh, when we said uh, let's actually start interacting with academia as well. It's no longer the Army industry. It's the Army industry academia. The belief was that there's a huge amount of uh, innovation which is possible at the university levels and which we know there are many countries which have been benefiting out of this extremely well. And that's precisely what was the belief system. And then there were so many other programs. Uh, what we just saw in this uh, five uh, solutions which have been uh, presented I would say, except one industry, balance, most of them have been actually the university driven. Uh, we, we heard uh, uh, Dr. Mini at a lab level talking of different layers using steel and just nothing but a plywood and how the intra-layer stopping a movement between, you can get an enormous amount of extra strength. To my mind, genuinely something which can be used without much of a, a ado. Straight away, every possible location, people can simply use it. It's a question of gaining much, much higher, l absolute low cost uh, materials, but extremely high amount of strength and the columns one can build out of it. Uh, Dr. Bondri obviously talked about uh, the uh, microwave landing uh, uh, systems. Fundamentally, these are systems which, to my mind, there's one constraint which we'll always see. It will always be the OEM and the flight certification related issues. So if those are something which uh, uh, Dr. Bondra can be really focused on, because I know uh, every machine builder will actually supply these systems along with his uh, platform. And those are where I see barriers. And uh, those barriers, obviously, I won't even want to say that army will straight away want to take on because they will actually see that limitation and that's a an loose end which obviously will need to be tied up to be taken onto any given platform and integrated with the avionics suite. Nobody will integrate anything onto avionics without those things. So that's a, to my mind, the balance activity which will need to be, need to be tied up and that's exactly how I see it going forward. In case of the long endurance, uh, which uh, Professor Saikia talked of, not just a matter of uh, a very, very intelligent structures, but he also talked very uh, specifically about those habitats. I think those habitats are something which truly can make life far, far easier uh, for the high altitude uh, soldiers. Uh, we're just talking in the morning with Vice uh, Chief, and there's so much of a movement on northeast side. To my mind, today the focus is going to be far, far, far higher on not those kind of high altitude, but something which is uh, to the uh, northeast to be able to fight. And those are uh, specific solutions using the technology, to my mind, that need to be focused on. Uh, what we agreed in the morning while traveling was, is there a specific document which can be made available? What is this northeast related systems all about? If there's Northeast related requirements which are very clearly articulated, it makes life far, far, far easier for all of us in industry to now know what is that that is expected of me. Once those expectation document and uh, very clearly was talked about within a couple of uh, weeks, months, this would be made available. So it's like the ground rules of what is expected, what is required, how it will be measured. 
and once that is known we can adapt the existing solutions to